Bletchley Park. Today, a vibrant heritage attraction and museum open daily to visitors. In World War II, this was the secret epicentre of Allied codebreaking and a hub of British signals intelligence. Bletchley Park grew from a small team of specialists to a vast intelligence factory of thousands of dedicated women and men. A place where modern technological innovation and human endeavour made groundbreaking achievements that have helped shape the world we live in today. Alan Turing was one of those people, a pioneer of computer science, influencing the digital age and contemporary society, an icon of the 20th century. For most of the time he was here, he was head of Hut 8, which was in charge of naval code breaking. The naval enigma and the U-boat war was one of the most significant, most difficult code breaking battles that the Bletchley Park code breakers had to fight. And he was also, uh, towards the end of the war, involved in the uh, machine coordination committee that was set up to work out how new technology could help the code breakers in various ways. During the war, Turing designed a machine for breaking Enigma, a single-purpose machine designed to help codebreakers discover part of an Enigma key. I think the biggest challenge that the British faced in 1939 was uh, the problem of the Enigma machine. And uh, due to a very uh, generous gift from the uh, codebreakers of Polish military intelligence, the British at last understood how the Enigma machine worked and how it was wired. But what they needed was a device to figure out how the machine was being set up every day. There are 150 million, million, million ways that the Enigma machine can be set up every day on every network being used by uh, the German Army and Air Force and the German Navy. So what Alan Turing's contribution to that was, was to invent a new machine that would crank through automatically all the different rotor settings on the Enigma machine and just do that without any human intervention. So automating the, uh, if you like, the attack on the Enigma machine was, um, was absolutely vital and his contribution was to invent the device that did that, the thing that we call the bomb. The bomb machines were a significant part of the Bletchley Park operation and heralded the industrialisation of code breaking. There are any number of situations where intelligence derived from breaking Enigma messages, so breaking them using Turing's bomb machine, are really important in the war. But it tends not to be one message or two or three messages that, that makes the difference. The point about the bomb is it allows Bletchley to break messages on an industrial scale. And what that means is by 1944, uh, for Army and Air Force and Ugma alone, they may be breaking 3,000 messages a day. And what that means is, although each message is very short, by the time you've read 3,000 of them, it's like reading someone's tweets or text messages. Once you've read 3,000 of them, you, you've gained a huge amount of information. The intelligence they provided was crucial in turning the tide to Allied success in World War II. An original and deep thinker, his research and ideas built the foundations for what we know today as artificial intelligence. Alan Turing uh, got heavily involved in the design of the first post-war computing machines. The, things that we recognise as being sort of programmable computers, you know, the ones that we have today. Um, and of course these didn't exist before um, the end of World War II, so it was a natural progression for him to move from uh, being involved in the Colossus programme here and then going on to uh, designing Britain's first, first electronic programmable computer. The thing that people forget, because they have this image of somebody who is uh, quite, quite withdrawn, who was sitting in the loft of Cottage 3, beavering away, was spent a lot of his time engrossed in maths books, 
He was actually an athlete. He competed at cross-country running very successfully. So many people don't really think this is, this is somebody who's, who's an outdoorsy, physical kind of guy. They think of somebody very bookish. He also definitely had a sense of humour. I mean, there are descriptions of his teddy bear, Porgy, that we have here at Bletchley Park. People would visit his rooms in Cambridge and Porgy would be posed in various places around the rooms uh, with learned maths textbooks open in front of him. He clearly had a bit of a mischievous sense of humour as well. And I think both of those characteristics run against the, the standard conception of him, if you like. Good sense of humour, um, uh, probably a wicked sense of humour from time to time, occasionally a flash of temper, um, and uh, somebody who, contrary to perhaps a sort of popular image, was somebody who, if you were on the right wavelength, was probably quite easy to get on with. His ability to bring mathematical theory into practice and solve real-world problems is a theme we still explore here at Bletchley Park today. One of the things that um, stands out for me is uh, the fact that he really was that pioneer of computer science. And I think he can stand as a role model for all sorts of people who think that computer science might be a bit nerdy or it might be uh, sort of, you know, not, not something for them. And uh, the fact that you've got somebody like Alan Turing who made such brilliant strides in that area. I, I, that's what I think he would like to have been remembered for, probably more than anything else. Obviously, uh, the idea that Alan Turing is recognised in the way that he is today and uh, has um, been recognised officially uh, by being put on the £50 note, I mean, that's, that's obviously an immense source of pride and, uh, you know, uh, of course, I'm sure I speak for the entire family when I say that we're all very uh, thrilled and delighted about that.